So guys, thank you very much for uh, jumping in. You know, for those of you that are uh, just guests with us or if you haven't been on here before, whatever, there's a lot of agents from all over the country putting it down here in the chat. We do this every Tuesday morning, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern, um, you know, 9 a.m. Mountain Time where I'm at. I'm in Colorado Springs. We're all over the country, but uh, this is always good. So again, if you can turn on your cameras just so you can you know, really be here, participate in what we're doing. Um, watch your mics. Just a reminder, turn those off um, if you got some background noise, especially. Okay, we'll try and monitor that as we go. Um, if you have questions along the way here, put them in the chat box, okay? Um, Jim and Stacy will go through what they're going to talk about, and then we'll make sure we hit all those uh, here when, when they're done and uh, get some good discussion going. But uh, totally appreciate Jim and Stacy uh, jumping in here. Been in real estate since 1997. Survived a lot of different markets, uh, including this one here so far. We're all doing good, but... Uh, you know, challenging market as it is. One of the things I know uh, for me, you know, I've been doing this 20 years back in uh, 2008 when the market turned, short sales became a huge thing for me. Um, and my biggest year ever was 2011. And we did probably, probably 80% of our deals that year were short sales. Um, they can be a pain. They're challenging, but you know, they're just a whole different animal. Jim and Stacy, you guys led the way in Ohio, right? With short sales, you were like the number one agents in Ohio. central Ohio. In Central Ohio, we were uh, tops in the short sales. There was something we had to pivot and adapt. And uh, I want to thank you, Jeff, for having us on. We're going to get to this. We've got a lot of great information for everybody. And I, I totally respect all the leadership on here and everything that we do. One of the things that drew us to EXP after uh, so many years with being a, a lot of, with a lot of other big name brokerages, Remax, Keller Williams, and things like that was the fact that EXP was a collaborative experience. Uh, when we saw it, agents giving back to agents, we got to tell you, in our market, agents didn't help each other at all. Like the top agents that were here, they kept everything that was working for them secret. They didn't want to share information like this, like how it worked and things like that. And so I love that attitude about EXP. Of course, everything else we love, the, the retirement, the revenue share, right? The ownership in the company, uh, healthcare, lead gen system, everything like that we have to offer. But this part right here is unique, I think, to EXP, when you agree, Stace, Absolutely. where Agents are helping each other, man. So we're going to show you today. We're going to share a screen here. And uh, Stacey will hit me. You'll see that if I'm over talking and uh, <laughs> if I'm over talking her, I have a chance to I, I do that, tend to do that sometimes when we get this. So it's working. Whoops. That was not the slide we wanted. I wanted to start <laughs> from the beginning. Hang on. Stop sharing. I'm going to try this again. Hey, you got to be smarter than the uh, technology. One more time here. Let's start from the beginning. That's what I tried to click. Let's see if it works this time. Start from the beginning. Nope. And I'm just going to click back. There we go. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Now, we're going to talk about short sales 101. For those of you who don't know what short sales are, what they are not is they are not quick sales. No, they're not short. Short is not the right word for the timing. Short means the bank is being shorted money. When you do the transaction, what's that mean? That means the seller wants to sell the house, buyer wants to buy it, but the seller owes too much and they don't have any cash to get out to add to the transaction, including real estate commissions. Now, before any of you dump out, we're gonna, you are going to get paid when you do these, just so you know, so you're going to get paid. And I want to introduce you to my wife, Stacy, who perfected the system and is a master at it. She is the queen of short sales in and central I, Ohio. I promise I'm going to keep Jim going because all this is in the, in, in the slide deck. <laughs> That's my job is to keep Jim going. Tell them what that is. What's a CDP? And That's basically designations. If you guys, once we get through this very quickly, um, if it's something you seriously want to get into and actually make it a part of your business, uh, I highly recommend these courses to the NAR just to get certified. Certified depressed yep. property expert and, uh, and foreclosure resource right there. So let's go. We're also uh, working on our four-time icon. So we're going to be talking about short sales. This is going to be an intro. What you're going to see is that there's a ton of information and... They are very difficult to do. Stacy, I just so you know, went to two full days of school to learn this and plus years and years of experience doing it. So if it seems overwhelming, good, you're normal, it's supposed to be. So um, go so ahead. Th this slide here, I think personally what we're already experiencing, short sales were already different, just a, it's a different game altogether. But the, even the ones now though, with people coming out of forbearance before in 2008, there were so many short sales. There were so many houses upside down. The banks were overloaded. They weren't even getting the files. So you literally could fumble your way through and complete a short sale that took about a year. Just not really, you know what I mean? Just trying to get it done. What we're experiencing now is 
when we get a short sale, there's not going to be nearly as many as we had in 2008. When we do get them, they're in crisis mode because the homes have equity, most of them in our market, probably in your market too. Right. So it's not a matter. They kind of stuck their head in the sand because they're so far behind on payment, not necessarily upside down in equity, that they try to save the house. They're just going to try to stay there as long as they can. So when you get it nine times out of 10, we're seeing it's already on the, it's on the sheriff's sale. We get it in crisis mode. So this system is all, it's definitely important now because where you used to have literally a year to complete it because the banks were so overloaded, they are pushing these things through and we're seeing these houses go and hit the sheriff's cell quickly, like within a couple of months after the NOD. So it's very important to understand this if you're going to take on the responsibility of doing a short sale for a client. Bad things happen to good people, right? Divorces, they get sick, they lose their jobs, things like that, where they may need to do short sales right now because who here, raise your hand, if you've had a buyer that you felt may have overpaid for their house just recently, go ahead and raise your hand if you've had somebody that's probably paid too much. They're in a bidding war and it's going up over the top. And as long as the market continues going up, things are going to be fine. But what happens? What do we know about real estate? What goes up will eventually what? Come down. It will come down eventually. And when that starts to come down, the people that bought at the top, if something horrible happens to them in their life, they're going to need short sales and you're going to want to know about them and you're going to want to have it already ready to go. So let's talk about it. So here's the thing, the challenges uh, that short sales present to most realtors. One of the things is limited experience. Look, you're going to need to get trained to be able to do this. You can do a horrible job for your seller and actually damage them financially to the tune of tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of dollars if you don't know how to do it right. You also need to have a uniform process and an application to do it. And that's really helped out now with the half of guidelines that came out. And also a lot of times dealing with multiple lenders. Maybe there's a first on it. Maybe there's a second on it. Maybe they took out a loan for windows and uh, roofs and things like that. And what's important here to note is that it's important for you to have a system and you to have a process because the banks no longer have the departments they had in place and the staff that they had in place to do short sales back during the recession. I don't think we're going to see a way where they're going to make that a thing. So if you don't know what you're doing and they don't know what they're doing, it's going to foreclose. <laughs> it's a recipe for disaster for your seller. Yeah. Okay. So what is the listing agent's role in a short sale? Okay. So if sellers believe the short sale is their best option, they need to know the following things up front. See, a short sale approval is never guaranteed. It's not a guarantee. Even if the buyer agrees to buy, the seller agrees to sell right? You still have a third party involved and that's the lender has to agree to it. Just know that a short sale requires sellers to complete and submit a lot of paperwork. There are going to be so many hoops for them to jump through. And also investors require sellers to have a valid hardship in order to approve a short sale. What does that mean to them? Well, we have a slide coming up on that, which we'll cover, but yeah, definitely. And there are even more because of the homes have an equity, it has to be a true hardship. Um, we'll cover those in one of the slides coming up. And just so we reiterate it again, short sales will take longer to close than a traditional sale. What's your record for longest short <laughs> sale ever? Over two years and, 20, and 21 liens. Two and a half years and 21 liens and we got it done, but we made what? 15, 16 grand on it, it was worth it. About a dollar an hour by the time we yeah, were done. dollar an hour. All right, let's go to the next <laughs> one. Whoops, hang on. The little click thing didn't pop up. There it is. Okay, I'm old. Sorry, I can't see. One more time, click forward for us. Okay. Oh, Did I go past it? Yeah. Sorry. There we go. There is, go ahead, you do it. <laughs> um, one of the things too is that short sale and a foreclosure are two totally different things. And the banks will simultaneously run the foreclosure along with your short sale. So you have to let your, it's your job on all of these. All, it, it's important for you to know this, but this is part of educating your seller. They need to be aware of this because it, a lot of banks right now, especially with that equity setting there, will not postpone a share of sale date if your short sale is not complete and closed and funded by the time the share of sale comes right. up. Also, if there are junior liens and they do not agree to the short sale, right? People that are on there in third, fourth, fifth, and sixth pos uh, position, the short sale will fail even if the first lien holder approves it. So you're gonna have to know how to negotiate with credit card companies. We had somebody that got iVision done that uh, they attached a lien to and the house. A point here, the seller cannot pay off that lien. So if they owe the if they owe a first, let's just say 200,000 and there's a junior lien for 10,000 and and uh they and it gets the junior lien won't won't take less, but the seller's willing to pay that 10,000, they're not allowed. 
the person's going to want any cash contribution right. in the process. If the sellers down. have assets, the servicer may ask for a cash contribution, right? If they're sitting there with a boat or something like that, we've seen them say, hey, we, we want that cash or they have a bunch of stock and things like that. And number eight there, depending on the seller's loan, the sellers may be responsible for the deficiency. Now, this part, the deficiency is where listing agents can really screw over their clients if you don't know what you're doing. You have to know how to negotiate away that deficiency or they can get stuck holding the bag, right? So here it is, number nine. Go ahead. If the debt's forgiven, there may be a tax ramification. Um, in 08, they came out with something called the Mort Mortgage Debt Forgiveness Act. And the reason that's important now, it's no longer in effect and that's the point to be made. Some of the sellers we're now talking to, they're doing a short sale, also did one in 08. And in 08, they're, uh, when, they, when the lien holder forgives them of the debt, the debt they take it as a write-off, a tax write-off. So your seller is going to get basically a, a income statement for the taxes. In 08, they were allowed to basically say, oh, the bank was allowed to write it off. And then you were allowed to say, okay, I don't have to pay any taxes on this gift of this debt forgiveness. That's no longer in place. So you have to make sure your sellers are aware of that now that, cause we fight for the debt forgiveness. That's your goal as a listing agent is to make sure they walk away owing no money, but they are gonna get that that income, that gifted, and they're gonna owe taxes on it as of now. They have a 1099 that they're gonna give them. Now, if they have it, we, we're, we're agents. So we don't give tax advice and we don't give legal advice. So you're gonna wanna have a good accountant that you work with and a good attor attorney that you work with that can talk to them and take them through the tax ramifications. If they get $100,000 in debt forgiven, what's mm -hmm. that gonna do to them? And a good a good accountant knows how to offset that with their losses and things that they have. The, the short sale also will impact their credit score. In most cases, if a, if a short sale has, I'm sorry, a foreclosure, if a foreclosure has started, even if you complete a short sale, it's to most lenders, it's in, in their eyes and then even in the points, it's the same as a full foreclosure. There's a couple of uh, lenders that we'll talk about that make a, a, an exception, but they need to know that. And also if the short sale closes, the sellers must understand that they will need to wait before they can qualify to buy again. Um, we've seen them short sometimes, right? You can get them done in uh, under a year, but typically they're gonna be looking at a year, two or three years, especially if they're gonna be doing a conventional before they can buy again. We'll, we'll breeze past this one. Basically, okay. the difference between those two loans is one where they're going to either owe the deficiency or be forgiven of the deficiency. Yeah. Is there a recourse for the bank or a non-recourse? There you mm -hmm. go. So credit implications, a seller who is uh, pursuing a short sale may want to know how a short sale will affect their credit score. The answer is that it's impossible to specify the exact number of points by which a short sale will lower the credit score. Uh, credit scores are complex and take into consideration a number of factors. Um, but you just need to let them know it is going to affect your score, which it's going to go down. Typically, by the time you get a short sale, though, they're already in trouble. They're already maxed out their credit cards. They're already missing payments here and there. So uh, usually it's not a big deal. They're just trying to avoid a foreclosure and a bankruptcy. Okay, so let's talk about short sale versus foreclosure. Yeah, go ahead. Here's a couple of examples. As you can see, we don't need to go over it because it's on the screen, like when they can purchase again versus that they had done a full foreclosure. The interesting one to point out on here is the VA. As long as it wasn't a VA loan that they did the short sale on, there's literally, they could do a short sale, close on it and apply for a VA loan the next day. Obviously it's an underwriter's call. They review the hardship also, but I think that's pretty interesting. Yep, oh. beautiful. So the Mortgage Debt yeah, Forgiveness we Act, about. we talked about that in 2007. Look, they could reactivate it if the world went to crap and uh, you know we uh, went back to another 2008, which by the way, we are not forecasting that at all. It happens, it's a completely different scenario, even with inflation, things that we're having. Um, we're not going to see that, right? There was a huge, there was too much inventory in 2008. Right now, I don't think there's any markets where there's too much inventory. These short sales would be for people who had something horrific happen. They got cancer. They couldn't work for two years. They fell behind their payments. You got it. There we go. Here's the <laughs> hardship on the next slide. Go ahead, Stacey. So um, this is key. In 08, literally, when that whole thing was going on, you could literally say, uh, you know, I lost my job for two weeks and it was stamped as a valid hardship. It was kind of crazy back then because the whole system was flooded with them and they kind of pushed them through. That is not the case now. Their um, they're valid, uh, valid financial hardship is a job loss uh, that extended for a long period of time, divorce, medical reasons. But when you state it, you have to prove it and you have to prove the hardship. Um, not valid financial hardships are um, 
I decided to run all, you know. I don't want the house anymore. Yeah. That's not a valid, yeah. <laughs> that's not a valid hardship. Tell about the one you just did down in Washington Courthouse. Tell yeah. the story on that one. Uh, young the, kid, don't yeah. use his name. Yeah, that was, uh, actually it was a young investor. He just got in over his head. Um, he had, and then he flipped it and put renters in there. They didn't pay for two years through COVID. So, um, but yeah, that, so basically that was- It was the, a referral yeah. from a friend of ours. We took it, it was a $75,000 deal, right? How many of you here would be signing up to do a $75,000 deal? Well, we don't look at things that way, right? We decided to take it and you ended up doing what? Uh, we did a dual agency. It's the only time I practice dual agency is on a, on a short sale. I don't mind beating up banks on the other side. Um, but it was an investor that was buying it. And the investor actually gave me an inducement to uh, get, we had to ask for some extensions and stuff like that. So on a $75,000 deal, we ended up making like an $8,000 commission. $8,000 commission to a <laughs> $75,000 deal. That worked out all right, I think, in our behavior. There you go. Um, strategic default. This is very, very important. I don't think this is going to be happening this go around, but we did have some agents that got messed up with this in 08. M majority of, um, in order to be approved for a short sale, you have to be in in a derogatory standard. Basically, you have to be behind on your payments. So in 08, there was some stuff going on where people, uh, agents, were advising sellers to go 30 days late in order to be approved for the short sale. Don't because do that. You you will get clients <laughs> that come to you that are in a finance that have a valid financial hardship and they check all the boxes except the fact that they've robbed Peter to pay Paul, they've borrowed money from parents, and they're still current on their mortgage. Unfortunately, they do not qualify for a short sale and you can't tell them to miss a payment, not unless you look good in orange. Do not advise your clients <laughs> to miss payments. Uh, you can go to jail yeah, for that. Yeah. So be very careful for that. Um, definitely don't get recorded if you do say it, yeah. right? <laughs> if you say that. Uh, so taking the short sale listing, prior to taking the listing, you should determine if there's enough time to get the short sale done. What does that mean? It, you're going to check the sheriff's sale. Yeah, I, right? I would, with this one, I would say, um, if it's, it, and I, I'm going to preface it two different ways. Probably don't ever turn away someone that wants to do a short sale, even if they're on the share of sale block, even if the sale's relatively close, I would refer it out to someone that knows what they're doing and get a referral on it because we've, we have successfully stopped share of sale literally days before yeah. the share of sale with a whole new packet, but it takes not only experience, but kind of we have a whole list of years of phone numbers, people we've collected from high, you know, it takes contacts. To well, get you just stopped this last one twice. Yeah. But we're getting yeah. paid on tomorrow. Literally. So I would say don't take it on yourself, but don't turn it away. Reach out to someone that does short sales. If you don't sure, have the, yeah, if you don't have the contacts at the banks and things make, like that to call and sure stop it. stress to the person you're handing it off to, the urgency, the sheriff's cell date, the bank, because that matters. And then just get a referral fee on it. Right. Refer it out. All right, so uh, there's going to be lots of forms that you're going to need. So uh, tons of extra forms. I know we all love paperwork, right, with uh, real estate. Well, guess what? Short sales have, I would say, probably close to five to ten times as much paperwork. You will kill a gazillion trees. And uh, so you're going to need authorization release information. You're going to need something to determine the seller's hardship as a financial hardship letter that's going to tug on the heartstrings and determine what type of short sale that uh, we're going to be doing and we, go ahead. We can, we can breeze through these next couple okay, of slides. Good. There's the authorization the, letter. That's what it looks like with, the, without our picture. The point to this is if you're going to take on short sales, come up with a packet, be systematic. We have this, we send it out. Every bank, a lot of banks will have their own format, but as long as yours hits all the, you know, checks all the boxes, they'll take yours also. So we have this as a saved template. If everybody gets down, you know, we can, something we can hand out if they want to take yep, a look Authorization at it. letter, a hardship letter. Um, you need to determine their payoff amount and estimate their equity. So one of the things you have to have is a great title partner because you're going to be doing all kinds of estimated HUDs. Here's what I would what I would say about this slide. If you go into a listing presentation or a listing interview and you think it's a normal listing interview and the sales price is 200000 and they owe 190 so they think they can sell because they've got equity, it, that, that's where we, this is why this is important is it's, uh, you will encounter some sellers that don't realize they can't sell without bringing a check to the table. Right. Um, so that's where it's all, yeah. Yeah, by the time you pay all the seller paid closing costs, right? If you owe 190 and uh, you're selling at 200, you're upside down on that house. You're not gonna be able to get out, right? Yeah. You're gonna owe money at the closing table. And uh, again, these are things that, for those of you who've gotten into real estate in the last 10 years, 
you might be saying, what the hell are they talking about? Everybody has equity. Now, eventually when the market turns, it's going to be the other way around, right? People are going to have what we call negative equity. And it's tough. Here's a buyer's uh, signature authorization. We love putting our pictures on there just so you know who we are. That's <laughs> non-bearded. That's what states when she did not have her beard on there. So uh, the seller's willingness. Look, this is important. Your seller has to be willing to submit all the information, all the documents. They're going to ask for all kinds of stuff. They're going to ask for bank statements. You, you're probably on their slide for that coming, don't you? Well, bank statements, tax returns. They're going to ask for all their financial statements because they're the, they, the bank's going to want to make sure and verify that they have a hardship. This slide is pointing out that when you, when a seller is in a short sell situation, it's as if they're purchasing the loan. They have to provide the exact same information, two years tax returns, pay stubs, W-2s. But the problem is, is they have to provide that over and over again. Just because it's a priority for you guys and a priority for them, when you set in the bank's file, if that becomes older than 30 days, they have to supply it again. Again. So they have to be willing to <laughs> literally, in fact, what you and I have my sellers do, I just have them send me updates every month, their bank statement, their yep. pay stubs, and I keep it in their file. And this is important to point out, it's every seller on the loan. Because I get situations where the hardship is divorce. Oh, yeah. And at that point, one wants to do a short sale, one doesn't. You have to have both on board. Both have to be willing to work with you on the time frame. The reason I have the second thing there is because in loss mitigation, the turnover rate is extremely high. And this is where- That's on the you, bank when, side, the loss mitigation when, on the bank side. When you have a file, I touch my short sale files twice a week, whether I have an update or not, I'm calling them. Because if your loss mitigator has been fired, you will set in limbo and you will foreclose and no one says, oh, wow, let me take over Jane's because Jane got let go. Here it gets reassigned. That doesn't work that way. Or Jane just one day said F it and quits, right? Because there's and, headaches and are working most on. time when you when your loss mitigator gets let go, changes, leaves, you're starting over again. So that's why you better know quick versus sitting there waiting for, why didn't I get a phone call? It's been a month and a half. Yeah, they're not calling out. you. You're chasing them. They're not yeah. chasing you, right? Basically is the way that works. So the short sale packet, Here's everything you're going to have to have. There's a whole list of them. You can see all that stuff on there um, that we've got. And then with the offer, everything that needs to go over here. So like we said, tons and tons of paperwork. What are you going to add Probably to what I would say at this one, because of the new wave of short sales, you better have an offer. They're not harder to find. If you need an, just to get, because banks tend to have a short sale pack, one without offers, one with offers. The ones that have the offer are the ones that get work. So have some investors in your side pocket that'll at least give you an offer that makes sense to start the process um, because you're not going to have a lot of time. Like we discussed, you no longer have a year to complete the short sales. They're not take there. It's a faster resolution. You have to hammer it through. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, document right here has a list of everything. It's just some of the documentation that we use. So the steps of the short sale listing right there. First thing you're going to do as the listing agent is you're going to complete your listing paperwork like you would for your state, right? For your MLS. But then you're going to want all the short sale addendums and language that's going to go on the MLS. It's very important for you to identify to other agents that it is a short sale because they're going to see this awesome price. They're going to bring a buyer and expect to close in 30 days. Doesn't happen like that. It could be, uh, you know, 60, 80, 90. Uh, how long did this last deal just take you? Seven months. Seven months. And stop the With sale. an offer. Stop the sale twice. Stop the sale twice. Then you're going to connect with the lender as soon as possible to get the documents to them, whether it's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, right, FHA that you have on there. And then uh, the property, you're going to want to stimulate an offer, which isn't hard right now in this market. But when we start to creep up in inventory, you're going to want to price it so that you get an offer right away. And then if you need an offer to start the short sale price later, as soon as possible. Okay. So the disclosures, uh, the sellers must fill out the residential property disclosure form. Okay. Your commission must be very well spelled out in your MLS to protect EXP as a broker. And then uh, the title company, your title company must be familiar with short sales and be willing to work 10 times hard for less money. Look, when the banks come in, go ahead. I know it's what you're going to say. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going to go back to the disclosures also real fast. Seller's perception sometimes of doing a short sale is the fact that it's like a foreclosure where they're just washing their hands of the property. This is a normal sell. Yeah. So anything, any liability that they have to a, as to a buyer on a regular sale, as far as disclosure and stuff like that, still is in effect. They can get sued down the road if they didn't disclose something. It is not a foreclosure where they're wiping their hands on the property. Um, with the title company, the reason I put on there to make less money, 
they do. You're, you've got to have a really good title company to work hand in hand with you. And the reason that I have the less money is because that's the first set of fees that start getting nixed out of there is um, their title fees, unfortunately. Yeah. You want to hear the good news though? Uh, a lot of the banks are paying full commission to the agents because they know how hard these are to get done. So uh, you can actually get full 6% uh, listing commission. But done. a little tip, if you're a husband and wife, they will not normally won't pay one agent the full commission. So make sure one goes under your husband if you're uh, if you're going split to it out <laughs> right or somebody else on your team right so you're doing that um, you got to educate the buyers agents look uh, buyers agents especially ones that have gotten into business in the last ten years they have no idea what a short sale is um, not all buyers are good candidates for a short sale like if they don't have the patience to wait for the house could be as much as seven months like this last one like they need something now they have a deadline don't even take them to the short sale and I honestly. My offer that goes to the bank for the short sale is unsigned. This is key. It's unsigned because it, let's just say the buyer has offered 200,000. I do the short sale, go through the seven month process and find out the bank wants 210 and this buyer won't pay that. Right. And I'm in contract with them and you switch out. It's, it's, I, I send my offers unsigned. I prep every offer in place that basically we are not committing to a buyer. I will keep you in the loop as what's going on. And when I have that bank number, I do give that offer the first right of refusal, basically. But if they don't take it, I move right along to the rest of the buyers. Going to collect that. multiple offers during it. Uh, what's the most number of offers you ever had on one property? A Close lot. to forty, yeah, right? Something fun. like that on one property as we went. So uh, that was that was fun, <laughs> right? So if a buyer is considering a short sale, you've got to share the following. So the buyers agents who are out there, like, okay, I don't do that many listings. Here's what you need to know if you're going to offer on a short sale. The buyers must understand the process, and realize they are not in control. The bank is in control. All buyers must be pre approved. The stronger your pre approval letter, the better chance you're going to have of being the one that's chosen. The seller and the lender still get to choose which buyer. Properties are sold as is, even though there'll be a residential property disclosure form. The lenders and servicers will not approve an offer uh, to purchase that contains a home to sell contingency, right? So get rid of those home to sell contingencies. They're just not going to do it. Uh, banks do not uh, cover closing costs or cash back or escrows. They're just not going to be interested in that. In fact, home warranties and stuff like that, they throw those out too. Uh, the buyers must realize there are additional disclosures and release of liabilities for both the sellers and the lender servicers. There's going to be extra paperwork for the buyers to sign on this. Lowball offers will not be addressed. Um, on average, the length of time to close is three to five times longer than a traditional sale. Um, all offers are subject to third-party acceptance. Who's the third party we're talking about? We mentioned them already. It's the lender, the lien holder, right? As well as any junior liens that are on there, right? You could have a bunch of them. So even if the buyers and sellers agree to terms, they can usually are changed by the lender, including the price. The, the lender can just say, you know what, I, I want more. And they'll, they'll get it sometimes. Uh, lenders normally do not accept e-signatures, believe that or not. They're still looking for wet signatures. We just found out on this last deal, they're still looking for that. Um, inspections and contingency periods should start with the short sale acceptance. In other words, don't have your buyer going and doing an inspection on the property when the short sale hasn't even been approved. You will be burning your buyer's money, okay? But go ahead. I know you were going to say it. Here's what they need to be prepared for, though, however. If that seven-month short sale process, you know, six and a half months was just getting the approval, getting the final number, the problem is, is the bank doesn't care how long we set and wait. However, sometimes we're given a very short time frame that, yep, now here's the number and you must close by X amount to meet the short sale. So where <laughs> right. they had to wait for six and a half months, they might have literally like two weeks to complete everything, get everything done. It's it's Yeah, once it's the bank makes up their mind, now they're going to slam you through it. They've had you waiting for six, seven months, even a year sometimes, right? Majority of lenders are now approving short sales and then putting them into a system called the equator system. The equator system is... Lengthy. I thought you were going to say a pain in the it ass, is. but uh, it's a lengthy process. It's an online system that tracks them. Okay. So foreclosure and active short sale, just so you know, they will run concurrently. The bank is going to continue moving towards foreclosure while you're doing the short sale. Why do they do that? They do that to keep the heat on the seller, the buyer, and the realtor, and they're going to keep marching, steamrolling right towards foreclosure, right? Um, short sales from contract to close. Go ahead. Um, this is just talking about some of the things that could be expected cash contributions. Again, they're going to, they're going to analyze your sellers, um, assets and stuff like that. 
Sometimes they will allow the short sell, but renegotiate a promissory note or some side of like, you know, $10,000 worth of the original lien to be paid and all that's handled um, before you close. The plus is, is that there are, um, sellers can get incentives now. That is left over from the 2008 era, but it's still in place. So there are some incentives to help by, uh, sellers that may not have that. Subordinate liens are very, very important. Literally. Um, Tax liens. It can be anything. The, probably the worst one that we had was, I can't remember the sales price of the house, but it was the sleep, cl sleep clinic. A Jim, sleep clinic. Jim Put a lien on the house. Jim was talking about. And when <laughs> I talked to them, literally, it was because there are guidelines. The, the, the first lien will only pay X amount towards junior liens. As you can see here, a $1,500 max. I want to say this was like a $2,600 bill. And the guy on the, the other line told me, he said, listen, he said, I've got a drawer full of these. He goes, I can play chicken all day long. He goes, because I, I know they need me to sign off to close. So either pay me the full amount or we don't close. This is the collection agent she's talking yeah. about on the junior lien. So literally we had to have the buyer finish it out. So the junior liens are just as critical as the major one. And it's, it's, Sometimes you got to be creative on where that money comes from. I even covered some small junior liens just to get them to close. Yeah, we had had to kick in some commissions sometimes mm -hmm. to uh, make things happen, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So all payouts or cash contributions must be shown on the HUD one. We all know this, right? Everything's got to be shown on there. Nothing done outside the loan. A lot of realtors got in trouble trying to do stuff outside. Go I ahead. will say here though, with your junior liens, there can be arrangements made to pay a certain amount off prior to closing that doesn't have to be on the HUD. So if the buyer would have went to, um, and we made arrangements through the buyer's agent, that, buyer's, that buyer could have paid off that sleep clinic prior to close and got a zero balance and that's okay. Like the, it, that doesn't affect the sale of the property. So I, just, I do wanna make that, sometimes you need to be creative with junior liens outside of closing and before closing. Got it, so short sale approval letters, Here's what's going to happen. This is the goal. This is what you're waiting for. The approval letter to come from the bank saying your short sale has been approved to move forward. In that letter, you, the listing agent, need to know how to read that and understand, are they coming after my client for the, re the deficiency balance or are they going to be forgiving them? You need to know that and understand that. And this is where having a good attorney and a good accountant on speed dial with this, go ahead. And the very last one I have down here that everything I agreed to previously must be spelled out in this letter. Don't take anything it, verbally. It is absolutely critical, even if it's in an email. It's absolutely critical. In our short sale files, by the time we're done, they're about this thick. I don't know if you can see my hands, but three to four inches. I save every email. I save every documentation because when you switch file handlers, which happens a lot, one will have promised something and the next one says no to it. So you have to have that documentation when you go back. And whenever I get a short sale where we have done everything that we have, this, the seller's done what they've done, we have a true hardship, we've dotted our I's, we've crossed our T's, and we can't get where we need to go, I do send, I have a templated where I just plug in this, uh, the bank, I have the shareholders on file, I have the CEO on file, I figure out their email format, because just so you know, every bank follows the exact same email format for their executives as they do the people at the teller. So I will detail a list and it gets sent to ABC, CBS, um, HUD and Washington and basically say, you know, we've done everything that we've done. Here's what we've done. Here's what the bank's done. And literally we can get short sales through like in days once I send that letter, but you cannot send that letter with having everything detailed to show your steps, show where the bank has screwed things up, who you talk to, what date. So a lot of times they'll tell you in an email, we're going to forgive them of the debt. And then when that letter comes in the shorts or the, the approval letter, it's not in there. If you guys close without it, it doesn't matter what they said. Once the closing is done, it's done. Yep. You got to have it on that letter. And also sometimes banks sell these debts later. And then a collection agency tries to come after your people. And you got to have that on the short sale approval letter said, nope, banks said it was forgiven. And they can tell the... Uh, they can tell the collection agencies to buzz off. So why do short sales fail? Lots of There's a million and one reasons. Every time we do a short sale, we find another one that could make it fail. But typically, here's what's going on. Um, the banks are overworked or they don't know what they're doing or they've got new people on it, right? They're trying to pay the minimum amount of money for something that's very important. And here's what happens. They, they just take too long to respond. You don't have enough manpower to process the transaction, nor do they have the desire to do so. There's no guarantee the servicer will approve a short sale and listing agents have the responsibility. 
to create a contract that has a reasonable chance of closing into monitor transaction throughout the approval process. I have in big red bolding listings agents negligence because yes, the banks are, we already know the banks are screwed up. They're going to screw it up. It is up to you twice a week to touch that file, push it through and make sure the banks don't, this stuff doesn't happen. And when she says push, she means ram it through if you have to, right? It is up to you to be on the ball, constantly calling the banks. And now you know why old, uh, not old timers, seasoned agents like us, right? We don't, we don't say old timers, Jeff, where we say seasoned agents, but um, we shudder when we hear that short sales are coming back, but we know they're a necessary evil when they come through. So um, we want to thank everybody for jumping on. If you have questions, we're going to go to the chat box here in a second, but Stacey, I want to let you know this. Um, one of the great parts about eXp is we have 77,000 agents, right? And growing, right? We're in a thousand agents a week or stuff like that. If this sounds overwhelming to you and you're just like oh my gosh i've got one of these but oh my gosh i don't know if i want to go to school to learn all this i don't know if i want to get all the forms to put all together stacy and i do these across the country yep and we can actually do the back end of the short sell nationwide and we would use you to partner to put it in the mls so you'd be the listing agent we'd be your partner on it for the negotiation side with the bank and you'd get all the buyer leads and everything that comes off the sign and things like that but uh, we, because we'd be doing all the work at the back end, we'd pay you a 20% referral fee on that. So you would get 20% referral fee for taking pictures, putting the sign in the box. We'd do all the negotiating on the back end and you get to keep all your buyers and things like that. You can reach out to us in Workplace or you can take a picture of the screen right there uh, if you get short sales and they're gonna start coming up. And so that is, uh, there we go. 1137, you did 37 minutes. Good job. We, like we whittled that, we whittled <laughs> that down. Um, who else has uh, who else has some questions? Let's see. Anybody got any questions on there? Let's see. Anybody you know, hey that? Jim, y'all are amazing, first of all. Okay. Thank you for that. Y'all are so good, you and Stacy. So one thing that maybe you could talk to just as an education standpoint. So one time I had a short sale, we were in the middle of negotiating it, like is to educate the client really not to talk to the bank, ideally, because yeah. if they messed the whole deal up, we had it where they were going to be forgiven, you know, their loan, they told too much. And then they ended up being on the hook for that, um, you know, for, for that difference of what we were short selling it for. So maybe just talk a second about that. Kathy's totally right on that. The authorization letter that you're going to have them sign authorizes you to speak to the bank on their behalf. It also authorizes you to have all their financial documents. And every time you call in, every single time you call the bank, what are they going to do? I'm sorry, let's, hear your, let's hear your authorization. <laughs> They're going to ask who you're calling in from. They're going to ask for the address. They're going to ask for the last four of the social of the person you're calling in for. They're going to look for on file that authorization and they're going to take you through a step every time verifying that you're authorized it, to you're, be in there. But you're very true, Kathy, because what happens is, is unlike when you have a question about your mortgage and you call in and you get the customer service or random person every yeah. time, your client is assigned a file handler that keeps notes just like we do. So they get the same person each time. So if you're saying they don't have any money to contribute and your client gets talks to them and says, well, yeah, I do have 10,000 I can put, it's, they're notating that and now they want the yeah. 10,000. So My parents why. could give me 10 grand. Yeah. Oh, now they're yeah. dead. Now they've got to cough up 10 grand, it's, right? It's in the file at that point. Yeah, it's in yeah. the file on that. And then I want to go back. I was, I'm sorry, that's why I was reading. George, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> and I'm going to walk a very fine line here because it could be very different. So George says he's had low ball offers be accepted by the bank. It could be very different um, with the new uh, short sales we're seeing back, but back in 08, remember when I said everybody was just swamped with them. They were trying to push them through. I, we became known as the short sale agents. We had a lot of short sales and I did have a whole group of investors lined up. Your fiduciary duty is to your seller, not the bank. So when we work these short sales, I want to stress that because you'll get agents telling you, well, you know, I have a higher offer. I can put in a higher offer. It doesn't matter. My job as the listing agent and the fiduciary duty to my seller is for one, make sure the debt's forgiven. If I know that they have forgiveness of debt, it doesn't matter at that point if it's 10,000 or 15,000 and then the bank gives me a number. If one of my investors is willing to pay that number, your seller still gets to choose the buyer, right. they're still in control. They're still your, so if I know my buyer or my seller's being forgiven of the debt, 
I've got a number from the bank. This, you know, this list of investors is willing to pay it. And my seller wants to work with them because it's, you know, just a better situation for them. That's okay. You, it doesn't matter if you have a higher offer. You're, it's not your fiduciary duty to the bank to get the highest offer. What else do we have on there? I think that was it. Who else got a question? If you have a question, you can. Can I throw out something, Jim? I remember just to throw this out back in, and I want to say it was probably 2009, excuse me, 2010. I remember because I was doing a ton of these and I went to Denver and I went up there uh, and I actually, and I forget which bank it was. I don't remember what bank, but man, I walked into this room and I'm not kidding you. It was like, it looked like a warehouse. It's all these people in cubicles. And I'm walking down the rows of these people and they literally have stacks of files on their desk. And these are the people that were, these are the negotiators for the short sales. And I remember one of the things I learned with this, you know, big time was all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're in this waiting period and you're calling twice a week and you're doing all that stuff. And all of a sudden now you're starting to get the attention. They're starting to work with you. And all of a sudden they need an updated bank statement. You know, the thing I learned with that is, man, you need to get that into them ASAP because these people that you're talking to, they're, they don't care. They've got a stack of files. If yours is on the top, it's on the top. But if they don't have what they need within a day or two, your file gets set aside. They're on to the next one because they're getting paid for every file that they close. That's how they get paid. And if you go back to the bottom, you're like, holy, I mean, it, it, it could throw you off another three months. I mean, it's just, that was one. And I don't know if that's different. Anything's going to be different with this now, but can you, is that your experience with this? I mean, man, you got to be on your game with these things. It was, you know what I got in the habit of doing, Jeff, that's a very good point. If they needed one document, I sent the complete short sale packet again, literally. And if I, and if there was three ways to send it, fax, scan, email, what it went to all so I literally just sent the whole packet again. You literally have to send what they're asking for and then contact them the next day to make sure they got it. And they didn't get it. And you said, all right, I'm going to send it this time. I'm going to call you in 30 minutes to make sure you have it. And it was, uh, it was crazy like that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Kathy Carter says people still hate Bank of America right? oh. <laughs> we were around during that time. You know, Kathy, a funny thing is literally right in front of us, like there was no Bank of America's in Columbus. And I used to joke about that, that it was probably a good thing that I couldn't walk into a branch, <laughs> but they now built one right outside of our, our development. So I was like, oh boy. <laughs> when Stacey and I first did short sales, taking you guys back to 2006, and I know some of you are saying, what, 2006? 2008 is when the foreclosure crisis started. Well, in Columbus, Ohio, the new build industry started to crash two years ahead of time. And Stacey and I were in new builds. Uh, we were selling about 24 million a year in, in, uh, in real estate for the new builds. And so a lot of our past clients were new build clients and the new builders were sticking all kinds of things and they did zero down loans. They put in all the points, right? Everything like that. People were buying homes for zero down. So the builders were adding like nine points on top of every deal. And so when that market tanked, everybody was upside down. Everybody was upside down 10, 15% when they tried to sell. So we started doing short sales in 06. Our broker told us to go, that's impossible. Our broker said, you cannot sell a house and get somebody's debt forgiven. And we learned from a couple actually out of Salt Lake City, Utah, that was teaching short sales. And they learned it from back during the Winter Olympics back in the 80s. Salt Lake City built up huge. The Olympics came in. They built up like crazy there. And then what happens when the Olympics leaves to those little towns? It just disappeared, right? All the people gone, all the properties upside down. So they taught us how to do short sales. We learned back in 06, we started doing them two years before the market tanked. It was crazy. Yeah. I would say to someone said that our short sale packet, absolutely, we can share that. In fact, I believe what we're going to do, you guys were our trial run. Thank you so much, because I think we're going to be doing this in the world for um, EXP US, our icon series. Um, we're going to actually create a short sale 101 group in Workplace where we can share this stuff, maybe answer some questions for people, not just our group, but obviously everybody, if they have hurdles or something. Um, if you are not, and this is where I was not, I'm, I'm a salesperson, I'm a negotiator, which means I'm horrible with paperwork and systems. So I actually had an assistant that was, that, that was her strong point. So if it, if it becomes in some areas might get hit harder than others, if your area, you start seeing them, it is a very, I will say, pivot is a huge word because when we did that in 08, we, our market just tanked and we pivoted and we were very successful. Just like you, Jeff, it was one of our best runs, you know, that we ever had. We worked way harder. 
So, but my whole point on that was just make sure if you're not a systems person, maybe partner with someone that is, if you do want to actually take these on and start marketing them and marketing for them, if you do start now, because once they're here, it's a little bit late. So start getting some marketing together. We have some that you can take a look at that we're doing. And if you bump day. into one here and there, and you're just like, man, I don't want to go learn all that crap and do everything like that. And that just sounded like a big, massive headache. Just refer it over to us and uh, we'll work with you on it. You get, you'll get a referral fee on it. And then you can generate a bunch of buyer leads off it because it's going to be priced mm -hmm. aggressively. So you'll have all kinds of buyers coming in on it and you'll be able to do a bunch of business. Andrea, we will definitely make sure Jeff and them have the slides and Sean so they can put them somewhere and then our short sale packet too. Yeah, templates. we'll put it in the, uh, we'll, we haven't started. If you want to, you could, you could email it to me or share it like Google Drive or something. I could upload it into Workplace. Into and we'll group. put it inside the, uh, we're going to create a Workplace uh, group, a short sale group. I don't think there is one yet. So if not, okay. we're going to create one and then uh, you guys are all welcome to jump in there and join that if you're interested in it. And uh, it would be great. It'd be great to learn this stuff, guys, really dive into this. I think one of the things, you know, and, and this is really timely, Jim, I think, and Stacy, because last week I was talking to a realtor up here in Denver and he's, you know, he's been watching these. He, he did a ton of foreclosures back in the day. And one of the things that he's been seeing, like two months ago, there were about 10 sales a week foreclosure wise in Denver. Um, about a month ago, it was went up to 20 sales a week. Last week, there were 50 sales. It's starting to move up here a little bit. And I think, you know, again, as gas continues to go up and groceries continue to go up and just, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. There are a lot of things. I think we're gonna be starting to see more and more of these. And I just remember 08, you know, here in Colorado Springs, we had whatever, 4,000 agents within six months, we were at 2,800, you know, people oh. leaving the business, you know, and didn't know how to do it. And so again, the good agents, you adjust with the markets, you know, you learn how to do these different things. And even though they can be a pain, but man, when you got a bunch of them in the pipeline, yeah, it might not close for six months, but when you got 30 of these that you're working on all at once and you can handle it because it does take time, you and know, just you're, you know you're having banks, four or five closings a month and, and it worked out fine for us. Banks do not want to foreclose. They would much rather do a short sale than a foreclose. It's a big hassle for them. They, they don't want the house property back. secured. Then they got to go hire a realtor anyways to sell it as an REO and pay the commission anyhow. They'd rather short sell it and never have to take possession of the property. And so that point, there should never be a foreclosure. If you want to go out and look for these, look for pre-foreclosures in your market and approach them to do a short sale. You can, we, we call it looking for business under rocks. Hang on one second. I, I, we side. probably right. should have started with this thought process too. Remember, it's not just about us. There are options when you sit down with a family right. that is upside down, that is faced with this stress. The very first question to ask them is, do you want to save your house? Have you tried to do a loan modification? Because there is a program also. And in fact, a lot of your short sales now will make your seller apply for this program first, get denied right. before they'll allow them to do a short sale. But there are options too. That's why I want to stress. We should have started that in the very beginning. Make sure you're not forcing someone into a sale when there are options for them that they may not have explored. Um, the HAMP program, which is the, the basically the loan modification program. So uh, be be a well of knowledge with good intention. A trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. And uh, also just know there are people out there giving bad advice. And a lot of them are attorneys. Attorneys will tell people, especially if they're going through a divorce and they're going to be upside down in the house, they'll tell them. It, it, it makes my hair want to fall out saying it. Go ahead and just foreclose and then we'll just file a bankruptcy. Yeah. That is legal advice that attorneys would give them. And if you didn't foreclose and you were to get the debt forgiven in a short sale, you wouldn't even have to file a bankruptcy. So now we're saving people from a bankruptcy and a foreclosure on their credit report. Yep. Yep. So just be, uh, yep, be helpful. And most people that apply for the loan modifications, they're extremely hard to get. So eventually it'll probably end up back in your lap as yeah. a short sell, but at least you, you gave them, you know, we did our due diligence. You, for doing. You saved them. someone's financial life from a foreclosure and a bankruptcy. And you sit with them there at that kitchen table and you tell them, look, it's all going to be okay. We're going to sell it. You're not going to have to make the payments while you're in here. You're going to be all right. We're going to get the debt forgiven. You can just see the relief that comes off their chest and off their shoulders. And, uh, you know, when financial things are bad, everything's bad in the house, right? The, the spouses are, are tense with each other, right? The kids feel it, right? There's a lot of stress. And we can literally save people's lives, save their marriages, save their families, and we get paid to do it. And 
I think it's something that's really incredible that's been put so, in front of us. Brittany, I don't exactly understand the question. How do, how do short sales work when it's an upside down refi? So you mean maybe if they pulled out cash, where's Brittany at? Um, Cause that's a good question. If, if it's an original purchase loan, it is a much easier short sell. If it is a loan where they have refied and especially pulled cash out, that the, the, in order to complete the short sell, they're probably gonna want some cash contribution from that seller. Not saying you can't get it done, but it is a little bit harder too. And then investment, um, which is different than commercial, but investment uh, short sales are almost impossible. That's where someone has an investment property that you know wants to do a short sell. Those are very, those are very hard. They can be done, but I wouldn't take on the challenge unless you- <laughs> Unless you know what the hell you're doing. Yeah. So great stuff. So it's 10 till. I know we have a hard stop in 10 minutes. Anything okay, else? One, one of the things I'll just comment on, because you mentioned this, I think it's important, like, you know, as you find these people, guys, and again, you can find them. There's, you know, every town, every state's got different places to go. We go to the public trustees website, and that's where we can see here's the list of people that, you know, that have, you know, received the letter that they're going into foreclosures. Usually, you know, a couple of their two, three months behind on payments, they start getting that. It might be six months before it actually goes to sale. But you can jump in with these people. And I think one of the things I remember back in the day, I haven't done these for a long time, but I remember these sellers, like they had no idea they could even do this. Right. They just had kind of thrown their hands in the air. Oh, well, I guess we're just, you know, we're never going to catch up. Whereas if you can go in there and start educating, like, no, there's other options here, you know, whatever. And and again, like you said, you can you can save the day for these people. It was it was a very rewarding experience going through it all with all the short sales that we did. I mean, it really was as far as what we do as realtors. It was powerful. Those people are loyal to you for life too. That totally. refer you all kinds of business. One of the uh, the ads that we used to run and that we're starting to run now is not really, you know, you can put this post up where it doesn't look like an ad, but basically if you know anybody with, you know, that's under stress right now with a house because of the deferments, please let them reach out, have them reach out to us. They do have options for loan modifications. They can sell without any, anything out of pocket. So that's the other thing too, Jeff, along with that line, they don't realize they can do it. And also it doesn't cost them anything. The commission is paid out of the proceeds of the sale. It's nothing they have to bring to you the table. You will see sellers smile like crazy when you tell them, say, guess what, how much this is going to cost you? Nothing. You're not going to have to pay us a dime. And boy, do they feel better for you. Yeah. You're going to handle everything. The, and you say, the bank is going to pay our fee. And yeah, we're going to bank pays us. that with the bank. And they're just, you can just see it. You can see the mm-hmm. weight coming off them. Majority, majority of our short sales came from us posting stuff like that out of our sphere. Um, because that NOD list is huge, but normally if you're mailing them, so are a hundred other people. And so we just kept that message out there constantly that, listen, if you know anybody that's in a, you know, distressful at a house right, right now, because of the situation, have them reach out to us and don't just talk about the, the short sale. They, they have options. There's loan modifications. They can sell without paying any commission. Like, yeah. So we had that message out there sporadically and most of them were referrals. Let's hope they don't let's uh, everybody cross our fingers. Let's hope they don't come back like they were in 08 ever, ever, ever again in our lifetimes. But if so, just so you know, real estate always gets done. No matter what happens in the market, it always gets done. Uh, it just, guess what? For people who just got in the last 10 years, this is easy right now. So enjoy it. Get after it. It's really super easy because it gets hard sometimes. You made a great point that I want to emphasize earlier in, in your presentation about that, that communication with that other agent. Because there's so many new agents oh, yeah. in the last 10 years that have never done one of these. And again, that communication, letting them know that this is, you know, there's nothing short about a short sale. Like this could we, take yeah. months. We've decided, we've decided this time, Jeff, we're going to create a video series but for the most often asked questions, and we're going to have it on our YouTube channel, when they send us a, a dumb question because they're uneducated on the short sale process, we're just going to send them the video link and, and they can watch that. And I've that. learned my lesson, Jeff, because in 08, I was not the best co-oping agent because I had zero patience for a ton of agents that didn't know what <laughs> they were doing. Those. So now <laughs> that I'm going back to them and saying, hey, how you doing? Want to talk about the <laughs> Do you remember how you treated me I, on that short sale I, deal? Back literally, I did a, a panel the other day for the Women's Council of Real Estate, and one of the agents I was on there for, we've been selling for decades, we're talking, and I said, I just want to apologize to anybody out there, like, we're laughing about short sales and stuff, and she goes, do you literally remember the time when you hung up on me? And yeah. I had to call you back, and Stacey said, Stacey, let's just talk through this, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Real, real quick, um, George, can you unmute yourself for a minute? Do you mind? George Hemphill? Because you had a couple comments on here. Have you had any recently that you've worked on? Any in the last couple of years? Any short sales? Are they starting to come back where you are there in Indianapolis? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There are. Um, I just done one um, in December, and I'm working on one currently that's been a major headache. 
Yeah. Um, my goodness. Um, so I hopefully can close it this month. That's what we're waiting on is the approval letter. Right. Uh, that's like they said, Jim and Stacy said, it's always exciting to see that. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's starting to, it's just where you're marketing who's really, you can find the people that are going through to get those notices of default. It used to be, I used to be able to go down to the downtown and just check the county records. Right. They've made everything digitalized now, but that here in Indiana, that notice of default is public information. Right. So okay. you can, it's just a question of being able to get to the sellers who can, then you can explain to them, hey, what's going on, what's happening, what what you might have to go through. And like Jim and Stacy said, yeah, it can take a long time. So yeah, patience is very virtuous. Uh, my goodness. Uh, the banks will get on your nerves. Um, and like yeah. you said, the, the people that's working and doing the customer service, they don't care. Mm -hmm. um, you're just a file to them. So yep. Um, yep. You gotta yeah, it's trying to pick back up to answer your question, Jerry. Yeah, for sure. We're starting to see it here. You know, I think it's going to be a, a nationwide thing. How long have you been in the business, George? 15 years. 15 I started years. when the market crashed. So everything yeah, good was timing there, sales at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I learned early. I You're a survivor. You. You're a survivor, man. Yeah, Nothing yeah it up. started. Up. Man, my man. man. It was man. crazy. It started. Man, my man. 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 Everybody was selling. Everybody was foreclosing. It. Everybody was selling. Everybody was foreclosing in 2000. So curious. So in your market, like Jeff and George, um, is it just not the crazy market like we're experiencing here in Nashville? Like I'm not now. I don't pay attention to this to the short sale or to the foreclosures. Really, you know, there's always hardships people have, but our market is so ridiculous here. Like I can't even imagine very many people being upside down at this point. So just curious, like, you know, but they're behind on their payments. Is, there's, there's job loss, there's divorce, well, different since, things. All of a sudden they're three or four months. That's, you know, since 2020 and 2021 and the government was protecting everybody. Now it's starting to, you know, that's, that's, that's been now it's starting to, people are starting to say, Hey, I can't afford to catch up no more. Or, you know, this is, I'm gonna have to let it go. And yeah, it's, it's starting to pick up. Uh, but the market is crazy because there's so many buyers right now. I think Kathy was saying that. It's so many buyers right now. And most of them are investors. They have cash. How do you tell your seller not to take a cash deal? You yeah. Know, you know, compared to a FHA loan, like <laughs> that's almost right. a no brainer for the seller. I know Jeff's got a hard stop in. We're, we're good. We got a minute here. Oh. Yeah, one of the things I'll just share, and I'm, this happened back in the day when they were really big, and I remember, and again, this may or may not come up again, but I had a person, this lady. I mean, she just she loved dealing with these. I would give all of them to her. She charged me like five hundred bucks a file, basically, and I so she dealt with the sellers, and she man, she had like I remember she had like six different cell phone accounts. <laughs> Literally, you'd go into her house. She worked from home. She'd have six cell phones and she'd have six of them on hold all at the same time. You know, this one answers. She picked this one up. She'd be talking to this. All the next thing you know, she's this. I mean, this is what she did all day long and she loved it. I can't do it. I don't know how she did it, but it was worth paying her out of every closing that 500 bucks. I would just get them and give them to her. We had a title company here in town that started doing the same kind of thing, had a short sale service that you they would provide where they would take care of all that kind of stuff as well. That will probably come back. You know, there will be those people that will come back in the game here a little bit, you know, um, whatever, if, if this does take off and, and start getting bigger and bigger. So something to watch for as well, but also like Jim and Stacy with what you guys are doing, you know, to gladly refer things to you. And cause you will get a lot of sign calls, buyer calls, cause the price is going to be so good. Like they'll be lined up outside the door at these places. What? So there's lots of ways to work this. There's, there's a group I can do uh, short sales from the Island. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So any last thoughts, any last comments, questions before we wrap it up? Anybody? I've got a few, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. First, Jim, Stacy, thank you guys. You guys are dear friends. Appreciate you being here. You've poured into close to 50 agents at, at the peak. Um, definitely write that um, waiver of the short sale deficiency balance as a contingency in the contract. Right. That'll get that done. Um, know the mortgage balance before you go into the listing appointment. That's something you need to add to your checklist. If you haven't been asking that, start asking it again, because you need to know what you're walking into. Um, 
title company, like Jeff said, I have a title company that specializes in this. They charge $1,500 instead of $500 because there's a whole lot more work. So they actually made more money, probably made less per hour, but they made more money. Um, the title company may ask your seller to make up the difference if the bank is unwilling to pay the full $1,500 in this case. Maybe they only authorize five. The seller is going to have to pay the thousand outside of closing. Um, and when you walk into the listing appointment, remember, you know, we are, we're already psychologists. You're really a psychologist. You know, Jeff made the comment. I used to say this as well. You know, man, I understand bad things happen to good people. Let's relax. You have options. Let's explore what those options are. Uh, the CDPE certification was huge. I mean, it was cheap. I think I paid 200 bucks for it. And I don't remember if it was a full day or two days, but that's a great course if you really want to learn how to do these and do them well. And lastly, this was not talked about. One thing I did that was very, very successful getting them done because the number one problem in getting short sales done is buyers get tired of waiting and they walk away. The way I kept that from happening and my sellers most of the time moved on. They were already renting an apartment or moved in with in-laws or whatever because they don't want the stigma of being in that bad house. But um, early possession agreements are key. And I know some of you don't like them, but I would allow the buyer to move into the house that's being short sold as an incentive to keep them at the table, make them have insurance, make them take all the utilities, put them in their name and so on and so forth. Seller doesn't care. They've moved on. And of course, I didn't tell the lender this, but uh, those are just some other uh, techniques. I, I did probably 50 of these in 07, 08, 09. Um, but I uh, just want to share a few more of those points. And again, thanks, guys. I appreciate you both. Very cool. So guys, we'll wrap it up. Um, this recording will be up. Thanks for having us. It'll be up in Workplace uh, here in the next hour, hour and a half. Okay, so you can watch this again. Um, you got Jim and Stacy's number there. It's in the uh, chat box, but also you can find them on Workplace as well. But guys, thank you very much. Totally appreciate you sharing everything. And thanks everybody for jumping in. This is awesome. We'll be back again next Tuesday. It's open to everybody. Come join us, okay? We'll see awesome. you guys. Thank you, Have Jim. a good week. You guys right. rock. Thank you.